it's really nice to get back into the swing of things and you know really appreciate the, the journeys that some of you have made and um, you know some have traveled a long way to get here today so thank you very much and welcome beat scad we've got an, a three-fold mission we work to raise awareness of scad we um, provide support to people affected by scad and we fundraise for, for research so um, we've got some of our awareness raising materials here today the walk is about supporting each other um, and we've been doing some fundraising so I know quite a few of you have bought some items from the, the shop today um, as Harriet recently saw some, some new clothing which we've been waiting for, for <laughs> it's been on the list for quite a while so we're really pleased to have got them, we're really happy with them and, and it's great that so many of you have bought them today so thank you very much for, for supporting the shop there today. So um, fundraising, so I mean so far since the charity launched in 2015 we have donated over £297,000 to um, Dr Adlam's Leaf Research work in, in Leicester. Um, recently that included £106,000 to um, fund a new clinical research fellow. So um, we had Dr Abby initially who was funded by the British Heart Foundation um, and then we've had Dr Alice Wood who um, beat SCAD, most of our funding has been used um, for, for Dr. Alice Wood's work. Um, and then now we're gonna have a, a new appointment um, and we'll hear a bit more of that, about that from um, Dr. Adam shortly. Um, but just a thank you to anyone, um, everyone who's done fundraising for us. Um, you know, that donation has only been possible because of all the fundraising work that, that everybody has done. Um, you know, and it's all comes from the SCAD community, you know, people affected by SCAD, um, are, you know, compelled to, to do something to help us find answers about this condition. So, so thank you to everybody. Um, and also supporting our recent Just Giving campaign. So we just launched that when we announced the £106,000 award. So we're working to raise £25,000 by the end of this year. So sort of by the end of September. And I know some people have already um, donated to that as, as well. So, so thank you very much. Just a couple of other mentions that I wanted to make, so I just wanted to give a little shout out to Nikki Gardner. Is she around somewhere? Where's Nikki? Mm -hmm. Nikki. Yeah. So Nikki is a clinical lead um, for cardiac rehabilitation in, in Leicestershire, um, and Nikki works with us on cardiac rehab programs. So this is a really important area for us with um, SCAD patients. Um, so we, we continue to work with, with Nikki, um, you know, to see what we can do to improve cardiac rehab for, for SCAD patients. So lovely that you could join us today, thank you. Um, and also want to say hello to Karen Rockle. <laughs> so Karen is my fellow co-founder. <laughs> Don't make a stand up. <laughs> um, so Karen um, co-founded uh, Beat SCAD with myself and Debbie. Um, and Karen was a trustee for our first six years. So she just stepped down in uh, November last year. Um, but continues to, to volunteer for us. Um, some of the project work is liaising with Nikki for the cardiac rehab work, but also helped us enormously with today's event. Um, so Karen and, and her husband Clive, um, you know, did some recce work for us here on the site, got photos for us, um, and obviously helped with leading the walk today. So, so thank you both for, for helping today. Uh, and then the Leicester research team. So we'll have Dr. Adlam up in, in a moment and he'll tell you all about himself. <laughs> that could take hours in itself. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, he's a, a cardiologist at Leicester, interventional cardiologist, um, lecturer, honorary lecturer as well at, at the university, involved in lots and lots of different things as well as SCAD. So we're really, really lucky to have um, part man, part machine, who somehow manages to fit in all these, all these activities and, and uh, make us all feel like we get 100% of your time. It's, I, I don't know how you do it. I think we have to thank your, your family as well, because um, you give it your spare time, you know, like today, to come and, and do these kind of events. So we really appreciate that. Um, and I know we've, we've got quite a few other members of the research team here today. So um, we've got uh, Jay, who's our receptionist extraordinaire, <laughs> always goes above and beyond helping the, the SCAD patients. And we really appreciate oh, everything you that welcome. you do. Um, Jane, um, re <laughs> research extraordinaire as well, <laughs> um, running the clinic um, and supported by Nessa. Uh, I know you spend many, many hours um, hunting down angiograms and making sure everything's there for when the patients come into the clinic um, and make sure that they have a, a, a smooth experience um, and get everything they need from that. 
So we have just got a little thank you for the three of you. If I could ask oh. you to just come up. Um. <laughs> No, they're being embarrassed. Oh. So I, I'm only just going to add a few words because I couldn't do anything without these people. And they are amazing and give a huge amount of their own time way above and beyond what they're supposed to be doing, either for research in the case here or for the NHS in Jay's case. You know, when you think about the people that you've talked about on the walk, where they come from, you know, people from way down in the Southwest up to Scotland, you know, these are the people that are on the phone, Jay battling to get the angiograms, battling to get the end, coming to meet you all in the clinic so that, you know, I can just have a cup of tea in the next room <laughs> um, after all the work's done. But, Honestly, they are amazing. So give them a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pity to have dead flowers. For <laughs> Um, and then just before I hand over to, to Dave, just a, a little welcome, obviously, to Yazik, I'm going to say it, from Jella. Um, so Yazik's here from, from Poland. Um, he's a lead SCAD researcher over in Poland, runs a SCAD clinic in Warsaw. Um, and he's currently visiting Leicester um, just to sort of see how Dr. Adlam runs all the, the SCAD research in the clinic over here. Um, Yazik has been co-author on some of the research publications already. so. Um, you know, this is all part of the collaboration that's, that's really, really important to, to the SCAB research. So, really nice that you could join us today. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So, I think that's everything. I mean, I thank my fellow trustees as, as always. Um, but, yeah, really nice to see you all. Um, and I will hand over to Dr. Adlam to tell us a tell story. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks, Bex, and you know, should just start by saying what an amazing thing Beat SCAD is, and you know, in terms of the work that the trustees and all of the other Beat SCAD members do, is amazing. I mean, that's a huge amount of money, and you know, the research that we do would not have achieved what it has achieved without the resource to be able to do it, and also. You know, when, when I look back to the era when I had the long black curly hair that used to swing <laughs> back then, you know, and we used to say to patients, well, you know, scad is something. <laughs> <laughs> that... <laughs> that, that is pretty much what I used to say to patients. So. Uh, but, So I thought I was going to make the jokes, but no, it's fine. Anyway, yeah, I, I mean, you're all amazing, and we, we couldn't do it without you. So and thank you for the invitation. Obviously, I left my armor at the door when I realized that nobody else had got the fancy dress invitation. So um, we have, so thanks to the fundraising from BeatScan, we have just appointed a new clinical research fellow. His name is Nathan Chan. Uh, he is a... Uh, relatively junior doctor so he's he's younger and more dashing even than me no uh, than you know perhaps our previous clinical fellows but what he is is inspired by SCAD so he has done an enormous amount of work in his own time over the last two or three years um, whilst battling COVID on the front line in uh, the medical admissions unit and he's the senior. Well, he's the senior. He's the lead author on the recent publication that we've uh, we've has just gone out into uh, circulation, which is one of the top U.S. cardiology journals. Maybe is the top U.S. cardiology journal 
uh, on pregnancy associated SCAD collecting uh, data from patients with that particular um, uh, problem from across Europe. So he's already demonstrated an immense amount of grafting and hard work um, and uh, gave a, a fantastic interview against quite stiff competition and we think he's going to be really fantastic. So he's going to be leading the charge, um, we'll be supporting him leading the charge on the research for the next three years. Um, and I think we'll also, he'll also be supporting us in the clinic, particularly um, helping us with follow-ups, because one of our challenges is that um, I used to say that SCAD was rare, and I'm having to row back on that quite fast because of the number of patients we're getting referred. It's not at all rare, it's un uh, perhaps uncommon, but there's quite a lot of you here, and there's even more um, in the inbox being referred up to the clinical service. So Nathan will also be helping us with that. I think he's going to be great, and, uh, and I shall look forward to introducing him to you in person when we have our is it conference next time around, and uh, that will be really great. So, yeah, um, we're looking forward to him joining us. I was waiting for you to sip your coffee so you couldn't, <laughs> couldn't ask a question. So, um, we've been having some gossips on the way around. I think the achievements of the research over the last, you know, five years or so have been as good as that. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, so there's been a, a, a lot of um, progress that's been made. So I mentioned the pregnancy paper. So this is a, a looking at that specific group of patients and trying to understand a little bit more about that, that group. Um, what was I I essentially sort of some top line summaries from that paper. I think we know now that SCAD in the context of pregnancy, most patients who have this have it after pregnancy. So within a month or uh, is the highest time, one month after delivery up to about six months. So actually uh, SCAD during pregnancy, although it can occur, is uncommon. We know that it's um, perhaps a more severe presentation in that context in, in some patients. But even despite that, the overwhelming majority of patients, so you know more than 60% or around about 60% of patients were still managed conservatively and I suspect that will increase and by conservative I mean without stents without operations and things like that so still possible in most of those patients to be able to manage them carefully and conservatively and that doesn't mean that stents are not needed in some patients I should emphasize that There's, there will always be cases where that is needed and there will always be a few patients in whom bypass surgery is needed but what we're trying to do is as little as we can. And that's something we've learnt over the last few years to try to minimise the amount of intervention that we do to patients if we can. Uh, and that's another lesson that's come, come through from the pregnancy study. Also, the question around um, pregnancy after SCAD. So again, it's a question that some of our patients will ask in clinic. Is it safe to, to be pregnant? And we know that SCAD carries this recurrence risk doesn't seem incidentally to be necessarily higher in pregnancy patients who have a subsequent pregnancy, but it, it can occur. And it's around about 9% in the series that we published, very similar in a similar sized series that the um, Mayo Clinic also published. So what this is doing is it's giving us some numbers that we can use to counsel people. So we can talk to people and we could say, okay, let's talk about the risk. And that risk in patients who want to become pregnant after SCAD is very individualized because there are lots of other things that we need to take into account in terms of um, how we quantify that risk. But now at least because of the work that Nathan and many others and many of our European partners, um, Jack, I'm not very good at doing the Yasek bit, Jack <laughs> and his colleagues also um, uh, were contributors to that study. And again, it's a nice example of how everybody works together. You get more uh, data to be able to answer questions with a little bit more um, uh, firmness and uh, understanding. So um, I'll perhaps highlight another paper because um, otherwise you'll all start to doze off in the heat. So another paper before that, again, this one was published in JAMA Cardiology, again, one of the leading American cardiology journals. And what we did there was we looked at the other issues in the arteries elsewhere in the body. And you'll know that one of the recommendations that we have is to do the screening from brain to pelvis to look for other artery issues. And what we were trying to do is to understand how common those abnormalities are and also how important they are. And, you know, essentially 
what we found in the study that we had was that around about a third of patients will have something when we look there. And the commonest of those things is fibromuscular dysplasia, FMD. Many of you will have heard of this. It's where the artery looks a bit like a string of beans. It dilates and narrows, dilates and narrows, and dilates and narrows. We do occasionally find little dilations of arteries, which we call aneurysms, and occasionally we find dissections in other arteries. However, probably most importantly of all for everybody in this room and also more widely, despite those things, actual problems arising from those things at the, over the periods of follow-up that we were looking at were essentially very low to unmeasurably low. So although we do find things, problems that arise as a consequence of those things seem to be extremely uncommon. As with everything in SCAD, more data will allow us to be clearer about exactly what the chances of having any problems are. But again, I think it's a nice message for patients that yes, it's important to do the screening. It's important to understand what is there. And there will be some of those patients that we will want to keep an eye on something that we find. But many of them, if it's simple fibromuscular dysplasia, we may decide to keep going with aspirin or not in that particular scenario. But otherwise, you know, that's actually something that we can leave. We don't need to look at it because it's not going to cause problems or issues down the line. So all of these things, these are just a couple of examples. Lots of other stuff in the pipeline, big genetics paper coming soon. I'll save the discussions on that for the conference, but we're going to have a whole lot of new genes to talk about next year. So, uh, uh, you know, um, lots of stuff in the pipeline, lots of clearer understanding, but making good progress. And it's all really down to the, the fundraising from this group because we don't have other funding at the moment. We've tried a couple of times to get further BHF funding. That's not been successful um, in the past. Maybe we'll, we'll try that route again in the future, but we wouldn't have been able to carry on doing what we've been doing without the fundraising from the BeatScad group. So thanks to everybody who's baked a cake, run further than I'm gonna to run tomorrow and done <laughs> all sorts of other things. Did you have a question from Joe about genetics? Yeah, there are a few questions that came in from the group. Um, there was one that I think probably of interest to this group here today, um, a big one for a lot of SCAD survivors is, is it possible to have a SCAD with normal troponin and normal ECG? Maybe a bruise that doesn't tear or block an archery. Um, so perhaps you get chest pain on exertion, but maybe just with rest, you know, you might escape having a heart attack. I think that's a question in the follow-up after you know, yeah. people are recovering. Yeah. Every little twinge means so much to us. Um, what advice can you give? Yeah, to? okay. So essentially, SCAD presents with a heart attack. We call it an ACS. So there is usually, almost invariably, a rise in measurable troponin in these cases. That's particularly true more recently because the sensitivity of the troponins that we've been measuring is higher now than it was back in the day. So we're much, we're much uh, cleverer, if you like, or much more precise at recognizing these events, even if they're only relatively tiny. Very, very occasionally, you can have a SCAD event without a rise in troponin. They're described, I think I can think of certainly one, maybe two, but remember we are talking about over a couple of thousand patients now that we have in our uh, registry. So this is a very uncommon scenario. Usually the scenario is in fact in the patient who comes along and says, you know, the worst pain I had was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then it's kind of, you know, largely settled down or maybe I still get a bit of a niggle and then they come and have an angiogram late on and you can see the scan on the angiogram. So it's probably not that the troponin isn't, wasn't elevated, it's just about timing rather than anything else. So SCAD, I think for the, all, 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 um, uh, um, for the most part, is essentially an ACS. It will always have a rise in troponin pretty much every time. And what you have to remember, of course, is that we, we recognize that pain after SCAD 
is extremely common. It's almost universal. Not everybody has it, but a lot of people do. There is a spectrum. There are some people who have relatively mild symptoms, and there are some people who have very intrusive symptoms after SCAD. We're still learning about this, and we're still trying to understand why it occurs. Our experience is, first of all, that it does seem to improve over time in most people, maybe not all, but most people. It often takes longer than people think. <laughs> so we know that the SCAD in the artery itself actually heals quite quickly, probably in around six weeks. It's done most of its healing and certainly pretty much by six months, it'll have healed in pretty much everybody. But the pain often seems to carry on maybe up to a couple of years after the event. And even then, sometimes I often say it's a bit like the old war wound. If you're kind of, you watch, oh, I'm the old war wound. You know, if you get a bit of stress, emotional stress, or something else is kicking off, it, that, the chest pain may come back. And, you know, it's the sort of thing that you experience if you're under emotional stress for some other reason. So post chest pain is very common. And so a lot of the time, if you're experiencing this kind of chest pain, it will be that. Our experience, and again, in, everybody's an individual. You're all different and you all have had slightly different ways that you presented with your SCAD. Post-SCAD chest pain is no different. Everybody's experience of it is quite different. But often what we find is that over time, people can start to work out the differences. And it may not be in the pain, it may be that the pain feels very similar, but it may be in the other things. Maybe um, the, the sort of, sometimes, sometimes people say they just felt that something was wrong when they had their SCAD. But actually with the post-SCAD chest pain, it's a pain, it's, but they don't have that same feeling of badness. It may be in the sweating or the nausea or the other things. Maybe it's not quite the same distribution of pain. But pain itself is very common. It's usually post-SCAD chest pain. That's usually not caused by any problem with an obstruction to the coronary artery. And it's you know, it, and, and as I say, it can be difficult to, ex to, to um, distinguish from recurrence, which we know is a problem with SCAD patients, that, and that is the challenge. But sometimes over time, people can work out things that help them to be able to distinguish it. And I think one of the messages is, if you have nasty chest pain and you're not sure, then go and get checked out. If you go to hospital and you have a normal troponin, you haven't lost anything, <laughs> maybe a few hours, um, but you haven't lost anything by doing that. And then you can go home and you can think, okay, so that wasn't recurrence. So that set of symptoms, maybe if I get that sort of thing again, maybe I can just give it a little bit longer, try something else, try a little bit of mindfulness, try a little bit of walking around or a cup of cold water or whatever it is that, and people develop their own things. And again, I'm all for that. Why pile in with the tablets without, you know, if you have things that work that you can think of for yourself that are effective, I'm all for that. What sort of time scale would you be looking at though, when you say if uh, somebody has an event happening that they feel that they don't know what it is, to then go to their GP and say, uh, I'm, I'm, I was poorly three days ago, two days ago, what would you say? Yeah, so I mean, if you have chest pain yeah. that you don't feel comfortable about, and it doesn't go away. Most of, some of you will have a GTN. You can try that, see if that gets rid of it. Um, but uh, you know, if that's the scenario, you know, the advice is to get checked out. Now, the challenge in SCAD is that a lot of the times that will be post-SCAD chest pain syndrome, and it's, it's this thing which is a very common thing. And you, you know, what you'll find is if you go to a hospital every time you get post-SCAD chest pain, you, you're living in a hospital. And so there's a way of trying to approach it to get your head around that. And I think sometimes that can be about learning. So if you go to the hospital once and your troponin is negative, you can think to yourself, okay, so that wasn't a recurrent SCAD. So those set of symptoms, maybe I can try a different strategy next time. Now, if next time you get a whole different set of symptoms and they feel different and you think, do you know what, this is the same as, you, just, you still have to get checked out, but maybe again you find your troponin is negative and then, so over time, and, and I think what, sometimes I think people, if they get admitted to hospital and the troponin is negative, it feels like it's a defeat, <laughs> that you've got it wrong and you've messed up and, and, and of course this isn't the case at all. 
what, the way to view it is that this is a learning experience. This is about relearning your body post SCAD. Your body has gone through a significant you know, event and it feels different after SCAD. There's some sort of healing process going on inside your heart. You know, we don't understand all of the reasons why this happens, but it does feel differently. And for some people that manifests as nasty chest pain. And so it, it is just about trying to work out a strategy that enables you to decide this is something I need to get attention for, or this isn't. Now, some people have very intrusive chest pain. And if that is the case, medications are an option. And there will be some of you who have had medications from us or from you know, your other uh, doctors that are looking after you to try and help that. Our experience with medication for post scan chest pain is that the ef effect is quite variable. So sometimes we have to try more than one thing to find the thing that works for you or for a particular patient. It's not always the case of saying, well, the magic bullet for post scan chest pain is this medication, off you go with the tablets and sort it out. Sometimes we'll say, well, give that a try. And if that's not working and you're still getting a lot of symptoms, then we'll switch to a different type of medication and try that. I, I guess the broad answer is it's not easy, but it's about, I guess, trying to de-escalate those chest pain moments so that you can rationalize them and think a little bit about, is this, you know, when I sit back and reflect, is this what I've had before? In which case, can I just see, because again, usually, though many of you in the room will have had post scare chest pain. And again, usually you'll, you'll think to yourself, well, yes. And it lasted maybe about, I don't know, 40 minutes or something. And then by the time the ambulance crew came, it kind of had gone away. And then I got to hospital and my troponin was negative. So maybe next time, if it's the same thing, just give it a little bit longer and see if it starts to go away. It's a tricky balance because obviously we want you to be safe, but we don't want you to be living in hospital with post care chest pain all the time. And I think there are ways to just try and, if you like, almost just step back a little bit if you can in that moment and try and say to yourself, is, you know, does it have those features of when I had SCAD? Is it going into my arm? Do I feel sweaty? Do I feel clammy? Do I feel sick? You know, not all of you will have had all of those symptoms, but you will all have had some set of symptoms when you went. And there's often subtle differences between post-SCAD chest pain and what happened when you had the event that enables you to go, okay, maybe this is the one that I can just be a little bit more relaxed about. But it's, it, I completely accept it's not easy. Did that answer your question? It did. I, I was sort of thinking more along the other lines that probably most of the people in this room affected would probably back off and go, I don't want to do anything about this, rather than going and getting something looked at. That's just my view on that. So, you know, I was thinking more along the lines of, well, if you have something, your GP should be aware of that straight away, earlier, rather than, oh, it's nothing really. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is often the case at the beginning, right. um, uh, at the time of the first presentation. I think you're going to get off full full spectrum of personalities, I guess, of different people who have different SCAD. I absolutely agree. We want you to be safe. Um, and if you're not sure, you need to get checked. That's the important thing. But I think my message is, is that if you get checked and it's OK, that's not a defeat. Have a little sit, have a think about it. And maybe next time, you, you know, if it's very similar, maybe a different tactic. And, you know, again, there are a range of tactics that people deploy that work. You know, some people will go to bed and have a rest. Some people will go you know, for a walk. Some people will have a, you know, a bit of a mindfulness moment. Whatever works for you is fine by me. Yeah. You've been talking in a sense about people's attitude and approach to what's presenting to them. And I wondered whether any research had been done into the psychological effects of having a scan, uh, either I don't know, anxiety, depression, the things that spring to mind, but those sort of aspects, psychological aspect of having a scan as opposed to the, you know, the physical aspect of having so some work has been done and you know we know for example that emotional stress is very important in um in the risk of scad itself 
so there's often an association and that is um, actually some quite there's quite well done research that was supported by us and um, done primarily in Holland by the Dutch group you know they they were able to assess this quite cleverly by making a comparison with patients who'd had non-SCAD heart attacks so it wasn't going to be if you like confounded by the fact that we're all stressed damn it (laughs) Um, but you know so essentially they were able to show that in a nice comparison that 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 there is a higher degree of emotional stress in SCAD patients before their events than in patients who have very similar um, um, uh, disease but with another etiology so that's definitely the case I mean no idea what an etiology is cause right yeah (laughs) another cause Sorry, you do, do interrupt me if I um, start <laughs> rambling. Um, so in terms of the consequences, again, there's some work done. It's not m- so systematic, perhaps. We do know that you know, there is a spectrum um, from people who basically breeze through SCAD, as some people may do with a health um, pro- uh, um, issue. I think many people, it takes you know, some time you know, to get your head around what's happened to get understanding and you know obviously with the kind of small recurrence risk that we have with SCAD trying to get that positioned and then you get people right out to um, uh, patients who have um, clear-cut post-traumatic stress disorder as a consequence of SCAD and we see that as well and one of the real challenges at the moment is in the UK accessing the talking treatments for those kind of problems is really, really difficult um, in the post-pandemic era. And that's um, proving to be really quite challenging for our, some of our patients who are more um, severely psychologically impacted by what's happened to them. So one of the things I was thinking about is if there seems to be a causal link in some way, does that imply that there's a management and treatment consequence to that yeah do you see what I'm trying to say yes I do I think so I think um, the emotional stress thing is as I say it's fairly clear Um, but I think we also have to view it from the prism of real life so I mean I sort of was being slightly flippant by saying we're all stressed but you know there is you know quite a lot of life has stresses in it and you know again we have a young working age family uh, caring uh, patient population and we have to understand that it is not possible to eliminate (laughs) emotional stress in this group i sometimes say to people that you know other than me persuading the nhs to fly all scanned patients to barbados to sit pina coladas on a beach it's not possible to eliminate stress so we have to you know i guess it's you know like a lot of these things it's about practical pragmatic things if there are simple things that you can do so i know you know there are some people who you know if they are able to might step back from a particular job role to something that's a little bit less stressful Uh, for some people that's not possible Um, but you know there i I guess it's probably for a lot of us there are some simple things that you can do that are within the scope of you know what is feasible in your life and working life um, to, to take a little bit of the stress out of things whilst living life and being real and you know because ultimately we want everyone to get back to you know doing the things that you do enjoying the things that you do doing your jobs if that's what you know because again we know that working is part of what defines m- many of us you know what would I do if I wasn't being a doctor I think I probably you know curl up in a corner I, I don't know I'll maybe let you know in a few years' time, but, um, you know, and w- when I get struck off. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we have to understand that, you know, the things that people do, are, you know, are important parts of them. And then that may be hobbies. And, you know, sometimes we talk about exercise and trying to work out what levels of exercise are safe and are, and are not safe. And again, we have to f- fit that into the fact that if you're somebody that does a lot of exercise and it's your hobby and all of your friends are at the gym, and that's who you are and how you define yourself, that for for me to say, no, sorry, that's banned, that's not realistic or, you know, going to really help your recovery. 
So what we have to do in those kind of situations is just to be practical and pragmatic and say, well, how do we define something that enables you to go back to that place that, you know, is part of what makes you you and still, you know, do some things without going, uh, you know, over the, over the line and putting yourself at risk. So it's, it's not a straightforward answer. Nothing in SCAD is straightforward, right? But, you know, I think if there are simple things that you can do, that's great. But I also really want you to get back to the things that make you you and your lives and your families and those things, because that is the most important thing for your mental health. In fact, much more important in some ways than sometimes making the big change, um, which can be quite hard sometimes on your mental health. So uh, it's sometimes smaller things that make the bigger differences, perhaps. Because going to say one thing and then I'll shut up, because I'm sure there's <laughs> lots of other people. So what I was thinking about is that there does, in the whole sort of psychological scheme of things, that, you know, pe people can learn to deal with stress better. So that's what I was thinking in terms of a treatment program or whatever. You know, rather than people reducing their stress by stepping back from it. Mm. Uh, yeah. Well, you know. I mean, I think that that's a great comment, which is, you know, are there, you know, uh, you know, naturally for me sitting up here as somebody who essentially, you know, bangs in stents or um, pushes pills, you know, uh, it's easy to forget those non-medical things. And I think uh, actually I'm quite keen on non-medical things, particularly for postcard chest pain, as you were hearing a moment or two ago. But I take your point that there's also potentially a scientifically rigorous approach to those questions to say, well, you know, is there a, you know, a specific program of you know mindfulness exercises approaches to dealing with stressful situations that that could be adopted to see if it's it's effective it's a very uh, excellent suggestion yeah could i ask a question about the um, i suppose the, the strategy and the evidence behind giving people effectively double anti-coagulating therapies immediately on, on um, Diagnosis. So my scope got us diagnosed was about four, four, four and a half weeks ago. So I'm now on aspirin and get what it's called. That's it. Um, and of course, you know, as, as the evidence shows, really. Um, but given the nature of, you know, the, the phys physiology and what's happening with scab, like the process, it seems counterproductive to use something that, actually, that makes you green. Yeah. Basically. So, so I, I, so I kind of agree with you. I think it's always, you know, it, it's always difficult to talk, talk about, a, a, you know, a specific scenarios. So I'm going to talk in generalizations. There are scenarios when dual antiplatelet therapy is the right thing. And that's particularly when patients have stents, um, because we know that stents are sticky. And if you don't have the antiplatelet therapies when you have a stent, then the stent can clot. And so, uh, it's very important to, uh, that, that, that people in general understand that there are scenarios when these medications are correct. So you are right that we and others have had the same thinking process for a few years in terms of saying, well, we think that SCAD is caused by this bruise or bleed in the wall of a coronary artery. You probably have heard me say this, the artery is a tube taking blood to the heart muscle. It has a wall of muscle cells around it. I sometimes think it's a bit like a car tire. So you've got the lumen down the middle and the tire around the outside. And what happens is this bruise builds up in the wall of the artery, pressure rises, just like any other bruise does, like if you've been kicked on the shins or something, it pressurizes and becomes tense. And as it pressurizes, it essentially squashes the artery from the outside. And that's the fundamental problem that seems to occur with SCAD. And so the question is, does it make sense to use medications that prolong bleeding time, which is what aspirin and the aspirin-like medications, clopidogrel and so on, do for a condition that seems to be caused by a primary bleed? And that is a question. It's, an, it's a question to which the answer is not clearly known. There's a little bit of observational data now that suggests that using the two agents may be less good than using one agent. In other words, stepping down earlier rather than later. Um, there is actually a clinical trial that has started in Spain. It's a first clinical trial in SCAD, which is 
brilliant news because this is where we need to go. We need to get better data. And, you know, again, collaboration, international collaboration with our Polish friends and others is going to be critical to this, um, which will specifically address this question. So what they will be doing is randomly assigning people to two drugs or one drug and seeing whether there's an, a more of a problem or less. So at the moment, this is around, if you like, expert opinion. So our current practice is to go down to a single agent early uh, and then to um, consider whether or not to continue aspirin once we've got all of the imaging completed. That's what we are currently doing. This is based around our thoughts and experience. Hopefully very soon, or in probably a couple of years time when the Spanish study finishes, we'll be able to put some numbers around that and say, well, actually what the study says is, yes, you should carry on with the two or no, you shouldn't with greater certainty. Okay, but your thinking is the same as ours, if you like. But I think also important to say that for individuals, you know, it, you just need to check on the specifics around your own scenario, or we will obviously advise if and when you uh, get to the clinic, which hopefully will be quick if we can keep up. Come on, Come on team. <laughs> keep going with questions, otherwise fire from the side. Um, I've got another one. Yeah. Um, so this happens quite a lot on the support group. Um, people talking about funny feelings in their hearts. Mm -hmm. Bear with me on this. Um, personally, I remember it feeling like it flopped or wobbled. Other people talk about it being like some sort of bungee jumping experience in, in their chest. Um, I think we're all experiencing ectopic beats and realising them, but it'd be lovely to hear you talk about that, and I think it'd be really reassuring. Yeah, so, I mean, in my experience of bungee jumping... <laughs> <laughs> no, you're all right. Um, no, so, I mean, the answer is, when you have SCAD, you have an injury to the heart. Often, fortunately with SCAD, those injuries are small, and the heart manages to maintain its performance. And that's the usual scenario in SCAD. Some do have larger scars, but often the scars are small and the pumping function is retained. But there is a small scar in everybody. Even when the MRI sa scan says you've got no scar, if I was to look with my microscope, I'd find something because otherwise you wouldn't have had the rise in, tr rise in troponin that's been measured when you came to hospital because troponin comes from inside heart muscle cells. So it only leaks out when the heart muscle cell, a little patch of heart muscle cells is, is, uh, is damaged, right? So, um, I've lost my thread. Remind me what I was talking about. Ectopics, excellent. So, what I was saying was that when you get this bit of damage, you're more likely, that's more likely to fire off a little bit of electrical activity. It's important to remember that, that it, or to just think about the heart almost in separate ways here. So the heart has, is a muscle, and the muscle has a bunch of electrics. And in, in cardiology, we actually have electricians and plumbers. So the plumbers do the coronaries, the electricians deal with all of the, you know, jumps and rhythms and things like that. But it's not bad to think of it in a different way, which is that you've got the electrics here. And the electrics, what's happening is there's a little bit of a scar, and that is just firing off a little bit of extra electrical activity occasionally. And when that happens, your heart's beating along like this, and it throws an extra beat in. Actually, you don't feel the extra beat. What you feel is that there is then a compensatory pause. So the heart just goes, oh, that was an extra one. I'll have a little rest for a second and just recover. <laughs> and, then, and then while it's resting, it's filling up with blood. And then it goes, oh, all right then. And then you have a big one. And it's the big one that you feel. And sometimes if, that, if you're having a few, because they can sometimes happen a few at a time, so you might get... <gasps> and then so you feel those, that, that thump. And that's what feels like the kind of the flop or the thump or, you know, sometimes people feel that they, they, they're almost like they have to hold their breath for a second up in the throat and then it goes again. Now, we know from long sort of uh, history of studies in people who have normal heart attacks that for the most part, these ectopics, are, they're not a problem. You don't need to treat them. You don't need to suppress them. They're not, you know, a sign of something terrible. They're a symptomatic problem. They can be suppressed a bit, and beta blockers are one of the medications, probably the usual medication in this kind of scenario that you can try to suppress them with. But it's a little bit like post-scan chest pain. 
You don't need to treat ectopics. It's about how intrusive they are. Just the same as you don't need to treat post scan chest pain. It depends on you know, how bothersome it is and whether other things are working. And the same thing applies here. So I'm not worried about your ectopics. I'm sympathetic about them, but I'm not worried about them. We can give you some medication to try and damp them down a bit, but that beta blocker thing is always a kind of plus minus, isn't it? So we know that beta blockers maybe reduce the risk of recurrence, so we try to hang on to a beta blocker if we can. But some people, you know, with they, even if they take the teeniest dose of beta blocker, they can't get out of bed in the morning. I have some daughters that are not on beta blockers, and they <laughs> can't get out of bed in the morning either. But, um, but yeah, so it, it, it is that bit of a uh, bit of a balance there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another one. Is there anybody else? Yeah, do fire anything, any, any questions that you have. Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One about blood pressure. Yeah. How important is it to keep an eye on your blood pressure and um, keep your diet as well as eating? Is it 120 over 80 that's recommended? So, yeah, so there is now quite good evidence that blood pressure is important. In, particularly, obviously, in people who have high blood pressure. So there is some observational data that says that poorly controlled blood pressure is associated with an increased risk of recurrence. We can maybe infer that poorly controlled blood pressure maybe increases the risk of the first event as well, right? A little bit of evidence um, also from the genetic studies, which I'm not allowed to talk about because it's not published yet, but you, so you didn't hear me say that. There's a little bit of evidence apparently might be in those studies that suggests that blood pressure also may be an important factor um, in terms of the genes that control blood pressure. So the answer is this, that blood pressure is important to control in people who've had SCAD. In terms of the targets for blood pressure, what I tend to say, to it, mainly because this is something that GP helps GPs. So usually for GPs, the people that they're trying to manage the blood pressure most tightly are people who have diabetes. Um, because with the diabetes, you need to be particularly careful controlling blood pressure and often cholesterol as well. Cholesterol less important for SCAD, blood pressure as important for SCAD. So what I often say is it's like you say to your GP, it's like your diabetic patients. That's where you should be trying to manage it. With blood pressure, as with many things to do with health, it is, that, it is a bit of a balance between taking your blood pressure every hour and you know, ending up kind of with, I don't know, blood pressure cuff injuries or whatever it is, and, you know, but keep it, keeping an eye on it. So if your blood pressure is nicely controlled, that's fine. You probably need to take your blood pressure maybe a couple of times a year or three or four times a year just to make sure it's not creeping up, okay? If your blood pressure is high, you may need to take it like several times a day for a bit while you and your GP work out a way to get your blood pressure under control. But the control of blood pressure uh, is certainly important. And there's actually quite good data from different sources now to suggest that that's the case. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a, uh, a genetic family link with sort of conventional heart attacks, particularly on the male side of families. If you have a situation when the male side of your family has that genetic link to heart disease, does that, does that affect a, a, a female? And, and is there a connection to SCAP? Okay. So this is more information that I'm not allowed to tell you about world time. <laughs> okay, um, so... Remember we, it's going on the website. <laughs> yeah, so if you're reading the website at this point, just wait until the publication's out before you tell your friends. Um, so, um, we have observed since the kind of beginning of starting to understand SCAD a bit better, we and our other partners internationally have, have, have seen that when we do your angiograms, we look at your coronary arteries, we see the SCAD, yes, but we don't see anything else. And yet we would expect in our kind of population age from 35 to 65 maybe uh, is where most of our patients fall. We would expect to see some patients with coronary artery disease. And yet we see very few, not none, but few with traditional coronary artery disease, atherosclerotic disease, the one that we, you know, all of the, the other people on the coronary care unit when you were in there and you were looking around thinking, I seem to be the only sort of, you know, 40, 50 year old female on a ward full of, you know, more, you know, men with traditional coronary artery disease. So, um, so that is something that's been observed. 
And what the genetics is showing is that there's a reason for that, which is that the genes which seem to be associated with SCAD, and what we're talking about here are the common variants. These are the genes that we all have. So they're more of a risk factor. They're not something that's going to, if, if you've got this gene, then your kids are all gonna get SCAD. It's not those kind of genes. They're the genes that you're dealt when you, when you get your hand full of genes when you're born. It's the hand that you're dealt at birth, all of those different genes. And when we look at those genes, if you look at the genes that SCAD patients have, they have a particular group of genes. And this is what will be coming out in this publication in the hopefully in the next couple of months, something like that. But interestingly, when we look at those genes, they're genes that we already know because they're genes that are associated with the other type of coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease or atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. But the genes in SCAD are the opposite way round. And of course, this makes a lot of sense. So these genes that are, you know, are contributing to the risk of SCAD are protecting you a little bit against the risk of ischemic heart disease. And what this is telling us is that there is a group of genes that have involvement in probably more than one, multiple vascular conditions, because some of these other genes are also associated with other conditions. We've, for example, known for some time that patients with SCAD have more migraine. Some of these genes will overlap with migraine. Fibromuscular dysplasia, the FMD we were talking about a little earlier. Again, we know that we see more of that in SCAD patients. That's kind of strange. So again, perhaps unsurprising that there's some overlap of these common genes with fibromuscular dysplasia. So a lot more on that to come. Um, but, you know, I think the key thing is that that work, which has been, I guess, a, this probably this genetics paper really is the, the pinnacle of what we've been doing for the last 10 years. That will be, you know, hopefully out late this year. And if we we're hopefully looking forward to conference next year, I will be um, hopefully talking to you for literally hours about all of these interesting yeah, genes. Two-day conference. <laughs> yeah, bring, bring your sleeping bags for that one. <laughs> and one thing I'd, I would like to say on the back of that is that one of the amazing things about this genetic study is the collaboration and partnership uh, internationally that has achieved it. Um, and I think this is really something that we should crow about in SCAD. So these, uh, the, the, basically with genetics, the more patients you get, the more information you get. So if we just do this in the UK, in our little shed over here, we find this number of genes. If we make friends, we find this number of genes. And this, is, this will be a study that involves the UK sample, so about five or 600 of you guys, France, the Mayo Clinic, Vancouver, Australia, and New York. And these are really pretty much everybody in the world who's collected DNA has gone, do you know what? we're in. And that's a, a real credit to uh, researchers, because you'd be amazed in the world of research, maybe you wouldn't be so amazed. Um, you know, pe people often want to kind of, you know, hide things and keep them to themselves. And I think it's a real tribute to all of those that are involved that everybody is pitched in to enable us to really take this big step forward in understanding the underlying causes of SCAD. Uh, what, what you said, uh the two things I think was quite interesting about obviously scab patients tend not to have other types of heart disease. Interesting. But were you saying that if, if the female has got male conventional heart attack family histories, uh, that that, you referred to it the opposite genetically, does that, has that affected the risk of, of, of scab or not? So it may be the other way round, in fact. So it may be that the, the, that constellation of genes that you get that may increase your risk of scan is actually protecting you from the family disease. So let's say, for example, you have a family that, for whatever genetic reason, you end up with sky-high cholesterols, you know, or much higher cholesterols, and that's what drives the family disease. But maybe you have this other bunch of genes as well, and that's what has been the risk factor for SCAD. But those genes are protective against the consequences of the high cholesterol and may be providing some protection. We don't understand all of this, but what we do know is that these genes in SCAD confer risk. And remember, this is not about risk in families. This is about the combined picture of your genes contributing to your personalized risk. 
but the same set of genes uh, in the population uh, is also associated with a lower chance of getting that conventional atherosclerotic disease. But you have a father with conventional heart disease and you have a mother with SCAD mm -hmm. and they've got two boys, hypothetically. Uh, does that mean that their risk of heart disease is higher, yep. lower or no difference? So the, the answer is it depends what they get dealt. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, uh, and that's, but you know, what you're, what you're sort of alluding to a little bit is the kind of concept of genetic risk scores. And this is something that's starting to emerge. So for atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, they're starting to develop scores where they can say, well, let's look at your genes. Dr. Adlam, we've looked at your genes and this is your, you know, this is your risk. And because, you know, you're particularly high risk, maybe you need to have something to, to treat you or something like that. So, you know, it may be that at some point we can get to that, that point where we can answer that specific question for an individual. At the moment, we're in a position to say, this is kind of interesting in populations, okay? And what does that tell us about the pathophysiology? What does it tell us about what, how SCAD comes about? What causes SCAD? And of course, having a bunch of genes gives us a whole bunch of threads to follow, to say, okay, I wonder, um, whether there's some a commonality here in terms of what's going on in the wall of the artery which makes that person who has that particular group of genes maybe is a particular age maybe is female and some of the sex hormones are doing something particular that you know all of these things are starting to add up to get into a point where scad occurs so we've got a way to go before we get all the answers but it's a big step forward yeah um, I know you made the comment that at one time you would have said SCAD was quite rare and the more we, you're looking, the more you're finding now. So what is the current incidence of SCAD, say, in yeah. relation to atherosclerotic heart attacks? So I would say, and you know, I, I <coughs> am sort of speculating, but I'm speculating on the basis of the number of patients who are referred to us and what we're seeing in terms of how that's changing. This is also interestingly being observed in other places that have clinics. I know the Mayo Clinic are also seeing incremental rises in patients. So there are two possibilities. First of all, it's getting more common. That is possible. Or that we are getting better at identifying it, better at uh, referring patients on. I think it's probably more the latter, but we always keep an open mind about it. I think we're seeing around 200 to 250 new scanned patients a year in the in Leicester Clinic at the moment, and that seems to be rising fairly exponentially at the moment. So if you do a little bit of back of the envelope maths, which I've been doing for GCSE with my daughter in the last few weeks, it suggests to me that there's probably at least, I would say, around a couple of scans occurring in the UK per day. It may be two or three. I think it's probably of that order. So, you know, not so rare after all, you know, given our starting point of whatever I said, don't say what I said to you back in 20, whenever it was, but you know, we, <laughs> I mean, we did, you know, we, we, we did used to say, look, you know, you'll never meet another patient with this condition. It's so bad. Um, and, and, you know, I, one of the, one of the, this is one of the good things about, well, one of the less good things for me, but one of the good things about the research is that, you know, if you're doing the research right, you get to eat your words sometimes. Uh, and, you know, that's some, that is, is, you know, it's the case with, you know, a few things, a few things that we thought back in the day, you know, you have to sort of change your tune and go, you know what, that wasn't the right approach. And I think when we were talking about treatments and aspirin joint patient therapy earlier, I have my view at the moment, it may change. And, you know, one of the really important things about keeping in touch, keeping an eye on the beat scan and all of that kind of stuff is that obviously we want to keep informing people if there's a change, if there's a difference, if there's new knowledge that we should be doing something different, then, you know, we'll be out there telling you about that. Sorry, Has yeah. the ratio of scads um, occurring in women, by comparison with men, has that remained about the same? It has. So around about 8% of scads occur in men. Now, we have been particularly interested in those as, as some of the work that Alice Wood has been doing and that's been kind of put together and they'll you know we're, again we're hoping hopefully by the end of the year that we'll have a male SCAD focused paper with a you know a, um, a group of men with SCAD that have been highly um, assessed and phenotyped and thanks to any of the chaps 
I don't know if there's any chaps here that came, but also on the website. And also the healthy volunteers. Big shout out to the healthy volunteers because we can't compare SCAD patients with anything unless healthy volunteers come to be scanned because that enables us to go, do you know what, that's different or it's not. Um, so still about the same 8% and about the same kind of percent, percentage, 8 or 9% um, of, uh, of them are pregnancy associated scan in, in women. So that, that distribution is still about the same. But, you know, I think it's perhaps not so surprising that there's quite a lot of it, a lot more of it out there, given, you know, the starting point to where we're at in terms of dissemination of knowledge. You know, there's been a lot of dissemination. Again, the BeatScan trustees going out there, talking to healthcare professionals. You know, I've witted on for literally days to many, many different groups. And, you know, it starts, starts to have an impact. I'm not saying we don't still have a journey to go down in terms of trying to make sure everybody recognizes and thinks of, of SCAD, but I think we have made some progress. Karen. I just wanted to add to that because in fact, it's thanks to Dave that I think that more people are getting diagnosed because he has spent the last, the last eight years telling everybody about SCAD and going out and educating people to spot it. Um, and so I think we have him to thank for more and more people being diagnosed more swiftly than they used to be in the past. But we're noticing the difference of, of people being diagnosed much more swiftly. I, I, I agree. I think it, it is improving. There, there, is, there is always a journey to go down. Um, and, you know, I think, again, in terms of making that move towards more conservative management, and I emphasise again that some people will always need stents. That's an important message because sometimes I think some, when, you know, if you're kind of reading online, you sort of see conservative management is best and you think, well, why did I have a stent then? And it may be because in your scenario, that was the right thing to do. Because if you've got a blocked artery or, a, you know, a, a lot of the heart is at risk, sometimes we have to do something to save the day and that may be stents in your case. But as a population, we have learned that we should try to do less if we can. And I think that message is definitely getting through. I would say probably in the first group of patients that were recruited, maybe as high as six or seven out of 10 were getting stented. And I think that that's now flipped in the other direction and it's more like six or seven out of 10 that are not being stented and maybe even higher than that in the last you know, uh, uh, 12 to 24 months. So it does work banging on about these things. And again, what I'm really hoping is that, you know, with the clinical trial stuff, the work that we're doing, you know, it was quite gratifying. The PSCAD paper has literally been out for a couple of days. And, you know, this, if, you, if you Google it, you can just follow it for your own Google site. You can see the number of news organizations that have picked up on it, the amount of Twitter activity around the paper, different clinicians, doctors that are kind of going, oh, do you know what? This is something important to read about. And, you know, again, those things, and that's where the research that you fund it has an impact because people go away and they read it and they go, do you know what? Okay, that's how I need to think about pregnancy associated SCAD. And those, those are important messages. Is it still the, the most common type of SCAD, sorry, the most common person to have a SCAD is a perimenopausal woman? Are you still finding that? And, and it, would you mind just talking a little bit about um, the menopause? Because obviously a lot of us have our SCADs in the perimenopause. So um, we've got people who have their SCADs at a younger age wondering what's going to happen to me when I hit menopause. Um, and certainly a question that gets raised on the support page quite often is this whole business of, well, lots of us seem to experience SCAD when our hormones fall off a cliff for a different reason, whether it's pregnancy, ending breastfeeding, going through the menopause. Is there an argument to be building about whether we should be perhaps thinking about controlling our female hormones a bit better, regulating them so we don't have these enormous peaks and troughs? Would that perhaps one day reduce our risk of, of having a scan? I know that that's a massive question, but just your thoughts would be wonderful. So this is an area where we need to make progress. And at the moment, 
we've still got a journey to go down to fully understand this relationship between female sex hormones and SCAD. There is, for example, a next step of work to be done with the genetics that I was alluding to, but not commenting fully upon uh, earlier, <laughs> that, you know, to try and say, well, how are those genes work? Do those genes work and do female sex hormones plug into how those genes are regulated? And, you know, that's some work that needs to be done and thought about. You're right that there seems to be this, you know, the peak or the middle age, the median age for SCAD is around 50, 49, 50. And so the peak age is in that per perimenopausal age. Of course, there is a tail leading up to it, including our pregnancy associated SCAD patients. But we do have plenty of patients in their 30s and 40s who are definitely still of um, menstrual age who are having, uh, having SCAD as well. We also see some tail going upwards. So we will see patients who are having SCAD certainly in their 50s, some patients in their early 60s. Interestingly, we don't see patients in their 70s and 80s with SCAD. I'm looking at, at uh, Jack here, no. So I don't know that, I don't think we have any, no, looking at the team, patients at that age who have SCAD. So that's kind of interesting along the lines that you're saying that it seems that once you've got out the other side of the menopause, that the risk seems to fall off again. But there's a lot more that we need to understand about this in terms of figuring it out before we're really in a position to say, this is something that we should do or we should not do in terms of treatment strategies based on hormones. I think what we can say, and this is a very common question, is the, the question about HRT, or the question about contraception. And I'll deal with contraception first and then I'll go on to talk briefly about HRT. Dealing with contraception first, secure contraception is the most important thing. So what you don't want to have is unplanned pregnancy. That is always a higher risk than any form of contraception, even the combined oral contraceptive pill. Having a pregnancy, particularly an unplanned pregnancy, is always going to be more of a risk. So secure contraception uh, is uh, very important. For um, some SCAD patients, there may be other ways, part of vasectomy, things like that, so that you don't have to think about the hormonal route. But if you're in a position where you do need to think about the hormonal route, then we would usually recommend progesterone-based contraceptives. And of course, these days, there are different types that you can have. You can have it in a pill form, you can have it in a, a patch form, you can have a Mirena coil. There are different types of approach. But obviously, I think the most important thing is that, you know, just because SCAD has some pathophysiological link with female sex hormones, as you've alluded to, we don't really understand that. We don't, it doesn't seem to be as simple as, you know, how much you have or whatever it is. It's not as simple as a just exposure, maybe to do with changes. We don't completely understand that. OK, but to date, nobody has shown in an observational study that taking um, a hormonal contraceptive, particularly progesterone-based hormonal contraceptives, which we would recommend, or HRT, increases your risk of having a recurrent SCAD if you're a SCAD patient. Nobody's, this has never been shown, okay? So any risk that there is, is probably small and is currently theoretical. So in terms of HRT, the situation or the advice is very similar. Yes, SCAD occurs in women. It's a perimenopausal disease in many, many patients. It can occur in around the time of pregnancy. There is something to do with female sex hormones here in terms of the pathophysiology, but we don't know what. Nobody's ever shown that taking HRT increases your risk of recurrence. That doesn't mean that nobody will ever show that, of course. You know, we are learning all the time, but that's the current situation. And so our advice at the moment would be if you're able to negotiate the menopause without HRT, so much the better. That's the easiest, simplest solution, if you like. If, however, you have intrusive menopausal symptoms and life is miserable, we don't feel that the data is currently strong enough to say, no, HRT is contraindicated, it's banned. What we say to you is, look, we already know that HRT has some small risks associated with it. Those are things that your GP will talk to you about already. There may be a, a, you know, a small additional risk associated from a SCAD perspective, although that has never been demonstrated as yet. So essentially what you're doing is you're adding a small theoretical risk to one that we already know about. And then you're 
you know, able to make your own decision as you will about those potential risks of clots or breast cancer depending on your family history and so on that everybody makes when they're taking their decisions about um, HRT or, or not to take HRT. So easiest if you're fine without it, but you know, being miserable and suffering through intrusive menopausal symptoms, we don't feel the data is so strong as to say, no, sorry, you're banned. Does that make sense? Yeah? Do you think that linked in with that, um, hormonal changes might be brought about by breast cancer medications to suppress various um, hormones? So, yeah, so again, that is a potential mechanism because we know that patients who have breast cancer obviously go on medications which then uh, alter their um, profile. This is something that, you know, uh, we are very interested in, as you can probably imagine, trying to understand this area. There are a group in Austria, in Vienna, uh, is it Vienna? Certainly Austria anyway, I might have got the city wrong. Apologise if they're looking at this and I've got your city wrong. Uh, who are uh, interested in looking and trying to understand how the receptors for female sex hormones might change and whether it's actually an imbalance between the receptors because we know that sometimes when hormones go down receptors go up um, that maybe there's some imbalance between the hormones and the receptors this is early early days but but as with any research we have to start somewhere so we have to say okay let's form a hypothesis let's say we think maybe this might be relevant the sort of ideas that you're alluding to here we are kind of agree that we think that these are interesting ideas we but we need to explore and understand them further before we you know at the moment i think we manage people for contraception and for menopausal symptoms and we think about what the research approaches to trying to understand this are we do the research properly so that we can then come back to you in a few years time and say do you know what we've looked at this now this is what we need to do I've got one more question. Yeah. Um, so then I'll start my talk. <laughs> there was a paper in March, and I can't remember who published it, so please forgive me. It was to do with collagen variants, and it talked about possible weakening of the matrix of the coronary arteries and the role of collagen. Is that anything you're not allowed to talk about? Can you talk about yeah, I can't possibly talk about that. Okay. But, the, you know, the, the genetic studies are going to be very revealing in that area. I think that's perhaps not complete news, so uh, hopefully my collaborators won't assassinate me when they see this. Um, but, you know, I think it, it makes sense, doesn't it, that if the problem is that the, there is a bruise or a bleed that's causing separation of the wall of the artery, so this is what's happening here, that maybe the glue that holds the layers of the wall together is an important aspect of why that might occur. And so, you know, I mean, what I love about these talks is that you've all got the same ideas that we have because you've all been reading and understanding your condition and all the rest of it. And in many respects, you know, our thinking and certainly some of the initial data that is coming out is along these lines. So what's nice is that we can start to say, do you know what, there's something in that. And that's the first step of saying, maybe at some point we'll be able to say, and so what we should do is. So you've got to understand the whys in order to take the next step to say, and so this is how we should treat this thing. Um, and you know, that's probably about where we are. But I think what we should say is, you know, quite, I suppose to some extent, partly because we started from knowing almost nothing. But I think there has been quite a lot of progress in understanding this condition. Again, a lot of that supported by BeatScan and those of you within the room to, to take that incremental step. We, we can only hope that we maintain that momentum. It, it's kind of probably going to be harder because we've sort of looked at the easy questions in the way that we can look at, look at them now. And then the harder questions are going to follow, those clinical trials where we have to try and recruit large numbers of people to be able to say, does this drug work or does this drug work? You know, the next steps of the genetic study, we can identify the genes, now we've got to understand how they work. You know, and those things will take, take longer to potentially build, but that's, you know, that's how we progress. And I think you know, the work that BeatScan has done in the UK research team 
um, some of whom are in the room, and the clinical team who are also within the room, but also our international partners. I mentioned them earlier on. You know, all together with you, patients in the US, patients in France, all of the SCAD community, all of the researchers, all of our amazing clinical teams internationally, research teams internationally, you know, together we can take those extra steps and get to the end of this road. I think we can. Hopefully before I lose the last of my hair. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sarah's always really good at making sure on the group that people remember that it's a 90% chance of non reoccurrence. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you did say that there was a link maybe with the menopause. Is there any research that's been done about when people do have another SCAD? Are there any links? Yeah. So Alice Woods work is partly looking at recurrence. Mm -hmm. So the second population, as you mentioned, that she's worked on the male group. So again, the second group that she's been looking at are the recurrence patients, and she's been looking at this, this population in some detail. I don't know yet, actually, for certain, whether there, there is any particular increased risk of SCAD occurring during the menopause. Um, we, we will certainly be looking to see whether that's the case. I wonder whether it, it will turn out maybe not to be the case, in fact, and just that, you know, SCAD patients have a period of vulnerability. I know that Postmenopausally, it goes away, but that doesn't mean that it actually goes up towards the menopause, if that makes sense. So I think that's still an unanswered question to be, to be clear about it. In terms of recurrence risk, we do have to get our heads around the fact that it can happen again. And this is not easy. We'd be much easier, wouldn't it, if we could go, well, I could just about manage to get through that, and then I want to <laughs> sweep scan under the carpet and move on. Sadly, we can't do that. But I think we can take some important positives from it. The first, as you said, it seems to be around a 10% risk of recurrence over a five to 10 year follow-up period, something like that. Interestingly, as we um, start to look um, at the more modern SCAD population, if you like, so the more recent patients that are recruited into international registries, it does seem that that percentage may actually be falling a little bit. I've seen a bit, bit of data from the um, Canadian group to suggest that their most recent cohort may have a slightly lower risk even than that. What I suspect is going on there is that, again, back in the day when we started, we were tending to be recruiting, you know, uh, certainly in terms of retrospective patients, the ones that have been really obvious when they presented. And so it may be that some of those patients were a little bit more vulnerable or for whatever reason, whereas now we're recruiting a broader spectrum of the disease, maybe that risk is a little bit lower. But Let's stick with 10% for now, because that's fairly accepted. Of course, you flip it on its head, it's a 90% chance, you say nine times more likely not to have a recurrence than to have a recurrence. And, you know, certainly I think, again, obviously, that's what we see in, in the clinic. Yes, it can happen a third time, even a fourth time sometimes. That's, you know, every time, um, every time that happens, it's kind of a smaller number and smaller number and smaller number. But... The most important thing about SCAD and SCAD recurrence is this. SCAD in general causes small injuries to the heart muscle. This was one of our first important outputs published in the European Heart Journal 2019, maybe 2018, something like that, where we looked at the cardiac MRI from all of those of you who came and we looked at the injuries to the heart muscle that, um, uh, that, 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 that it caused. And this is widely accepted. And so, yes, SCAD recurrences can occur, but even with SCAD recurrences, generally speaking, the injury to the heart will be small. And it is for this reason that despite this pesky recurrence risk, the prognosis from SCAD is excellent in the registry as a whole. People do very well with SCAD overall. You know, everybody does well. And this is, this is the reason and so, yes, we have to kind of deal with recurrences if they occur. The main message there, and it comes back to some of the conversation we were having a little bit earlier on, is that if you, you know, have a recurrence and you have symptoms and you go, do you know what? And again, my experience is that people that do have recurrences, it's unequivocal. So they're not usually going, well, I wonder if this is my post care chest pain or not. Mm -hmm. Usually it's, yep, this is the thing. I need to go to hospital this time. And, you know, what I would say is, we know that conservative management is usually what will be done in terms of stents and things, but you still need to be in a place of safety. 
Because really the only period of risk is when you have the pain. It's that, just that immediate bit. And so if you do have symptoms and you feel that you know, this is a recurrence event for you, then you do need to be in hospital for a few days. And you know, so it's not, I, th I think very occasionally I've had somebody who's come back and gone, oh, well, you said it was conservative management. So when I got my symptoms, I thought I'd just stay home. And actually, no, you do need to be in a place of safety if that happens, yeah? So, but I think the important message is, yes, recurrence, but I sometimes say to people, look, this is something that is a case with medical conditions. So, you know, if, God forbid, when you had your SCAD, you had breast cancer or, you know, something else like that, and you had an operation or treatment for that, we'd have to get our heads around the risk of, you know, some recurrence occurring. And that is part and parcel of some medical conditions, unfortunately. But I think the key message is, the prognosis from this condition is good. So we see the patients come back with recurrence, we scan them again, maybe a little small, small scar, but it's still a small scar. And the heart's still, you know, I have you know, patients with heart, my, my heart failure service who I, I will see who may have, you know, ejection fractions in the teens. You know, so uncommon to see that. 10 hours was that, yeah, okay. That's good. <laughs> Does that answer your question, yeah? But I think that's the, it's kind of just getting the, minds, the mindset right, if you like, which is to say, yes, okay, I've got to be prepared if something like that happens in the back of my mind, I know what I'm going to do. But on the other hand, you know, it's going to be fine. And um, we need to not allow that to come to the front and dominate what we do. Because you still need to go out there, as we said a little earlier on, do those things that you do. You want to go on holiday, that's okay. When I go to outer Mongolia, which has no healthcare system and ride camels or whatever they do. And, <laughs> sorry if you're from outer Mongolia. Um, but you know, I might think a little bit more about that, but the places that we like to go on holiday in Spain and so on, you know, I mean, Spain are doing the clinical trial, right? They know about SCAD and uh, they know how to manage it. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of about kind of having a little thing this big in the back here that's got, remember what to do, but the rest of it's not being run by that. Yeah. Um, this is a question that I've had in my mind because I'm not acutely aware we're talking SCAD. But if we were to take the coronary out of this, um, is there something special about the coronary arteries which can mean this process happens here? Is there something perhaps obviously special about the impact if it's the coronary artery? Or is this kind of bruising and damage happening in arteries elsewhere in the body that we're not talking about? So it's a great question. There probably is something special about the coronary arteries to some extent. And we sort of know that because one of the key things about the coronary arteries, which is very different to arteries elsewhere in the body, is the way that pressure and flow works. So because your heart is pumping, when it pumps, actually the flow in the coronary arteries is stopped because the pressure is very high in the heart muscle, so blood can't flow. So most of the flow in the coronary arteries actually happens during the resting period of the heart, whereas in every other artery in the body, it happens during the period of contraction. So it may be that there's something to do with that. We do know that dissections can happen in other arteries, particularly um, in the head and neck arteries, for example. And we do know that some of the genes that we're identifying, but don't tell anybody yet, do overlap with those conditions that cause dissections in, the other, in other arteries in the body. So there's likely to be an interrelationship, but it's not going to be necessarily the whole story. So they're not the same disease. That's my view. I don't think that, for example, FMD and SCAD are the same disease. I think that they are diseases which share some commonalities and therefore they, particularly in SCAD's case, coexist to some extent. I don't think they're necessarily the same thing, but you know, we can, the very fact that they have some overlap is something that we can help us to learn about them and understand them a bit better. That makes sense, yeah. So I'm kind of aware that I've been given a number of warnings, but... <laughs> That's never stopped me before. <laughs> any, any other thoughts, questions? Okay, great. So, yeah, fire away. Can I please ask about SCAD reoccurrence? Yes. Now, if you have a SCAD and then you're on medication, mm -hmm. and you have a reoccurrence and you're still on medication, mm -hmm. how would you treat it? So it's a great question. And, and the answer is, is we don't know um, at the moment. 
So what we know is um, that there's some observational data, which we discussed a little earlier, to suggest that control of blood pressure, where you have high blood pressure, is important. So that's a starting point. We also, there's part of the same study suggested that beta blockers may be useful if they are tolerated. So that's the second thing that we know. What we, the antiplatelet therapies, which we were discussing, I forget, a little bit earlier on, again, bit some question marks and some uncertainty over those, and maybe the clinical trial will help us with that. In terms of the recurrent recurrences, you know, th there is no additional information or data to say, okay, well, if that happens, then we should make shift this. So we would tend to focus in the same way and say, okay, is the blood pressure okay? If it's okay, okay. can we manage a beta blocker if we can? Great. Uh, and, and, you know, I guess we have to put our hands up and say that this is one of still quite, quite a lot of areas in SCAD where we need to make more progress. Yeah. All right. Any last burning questions of a ping, which is, what time will you be home, it says. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll text, I could be ours yet. <laughs> Brilliant. Do, 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 do surgeons typically recommend a, a, a set of drugs that are exactly the same in scab as, as, as normal heart disease? It seems well, to be the case. So, so often, um, historically, I think it's changing, but often that's the case, that patients will be sent home in the same bank of, of typical medications. And I guess part of one of the things that we do in the clinic is we try to look more a bit objectively and say, well, is this really needed? You know, is there really evidence here that a statin is going to make a difference? For example, we know that there's this, this process doesn't seem to be cholesterol driven. So, you know, based on the normal calculators of risk of having a high cholesterol, um, you know, if you, if you hadn't had a heart attack, would we have you on a statin? And if you've had only a SCAD heart attack, you know, should we be counting you, sorry? <coughs> Um, so yes, I mean, we do, and, and I, I know uh, Jazik the same, spend um, a fair amount of time, you know, thinking about this carefully and actually winding back on medications in our patients. I'd love to get to the point where we can, you know, as you were saying in your question, you know, wind forward and say, look, okay, let's stop all this other stuff that's for a different disease and let's start this stuff, which we know works for SCAD patients, but we, you know, we've got a journey to go down yet for that. Okay, I'd better go or I'm going to be divorced. Yeah. Um, but thank okay. you very much for listening in a very hot room. And that stuff. such an interactive session as well um, you know it's great to get all the questions and, and have the conversation flowing and I think it just shows how important the research is how important it has been up to this point you know we're starting to get bits of information but there's still lots and lots of questions there's still lots to learn um, you know we've got to get information out into healthcare guidelines I mean that's that's um, you know a long-term goal for, for BSCAD we keep trying to get comments submitted to NICE, um, you know, just to try and influence, but it's, it's really an uphill battle, and at the moment, um, you know, we're lacking a lot of the data that will influence those guidelines, so, you know, we need to just keep the research pushing forward, so, so thank you all for your support and participation today, um, and wish you a safe journey home, so thank you. Thank you.